Eleven. Morning Public Broadcasting has been pleased to be associated with the uh, ICEP series now for all these 11 years. And uh, it's just not going to be the same to be up here next year. Terry just keeps coming up with one great series after another. So we're not giving up on you just yet. How about a round for Terry? <laughs> Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Our speaker this evening, Dr. Jerome Rabbits, is here to tell us about his process of scientific problem solving in an uncertain world. Now, I don't know what could be more appropriate in these days of uncertainty. Uh, Jerry will address the needs of policy decision making, where often the facts that you have are uncertain and the values are often in dispute. That sounds pretty familiar. When you add to that circumstances where the stakes are high and the right decisions must be made under extreme time pressure, well, there aren't any easy answers. But our speaker tonight believes that there are techniques, there are tools, if you will, which can be used under these difficult situations to improve our odds of getting it right, which, of course, is what we set out to do. Dr. Ravitz is a native of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where his father was a truck driver and later a union organizer. He attended Swarthmore College and in 1950 was awarded a Fulbright scholarship to Trinity College at Cambridge. He did his PhD in mathematics, but uh, he then soon moved on to the field of history and philosophy of science, which he has taught at uh, Leeds College for many years. Uh, Dr. Rabbit's been associated with many institutions worldwide, including Utrecht, Harvard, Princeton, and Carnegie Mellon. He is now an independent consultant, and he works mainly on problems of management of uncertainty in risks and in environmental issues. He has written a number of books in his area of expertise, and most recently, Uncertainty and Quality in Science for Policy. As he puts it, the assumption of certainty, which has been for so long so central to science, just doesn't hold for science, for science in the policy domain anymore. To introduce us to this new ball game, please join me in extending a warm Oregon welcome to Dr. Jerome Rabbits. Well, good evening. Uh, I'm just uh, adjusting my lights uh, so that I can see people in spite of the spots. Plug in my mic, thank you. Oh, yes. You get her. Sorry, we left it all over here. You're picking up on that one, but this is one. We can all hear me now. Great. Oh, so now I'm tethered. Now you're tethered. Right. Okay. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I've had a busy week as a guest of Terry's Institute for Science, Engineering, and Public Policy. Uh, I've lectured at a variety of institutions uh, on topics uh, playing variations on my main theme. And uh, some people from those institutions who might be here uh, may have sensed that I was talking about all sorts of other things because I felt I didn't want to give the game away and give the same lecture twice. Um, so for those who aren't here, I'm sorry, but you've missed the main event of the week. <laughs> then that's your problem. Uh, it's been, I have to confess, for me, it's uh, really been a holiday to be taken by Terry to see so very many friendly people and to exchange ideas with him and with them on these very important topics that concern us all. Tonight is a much more formal occasion, wearing my business suit, uh, I'm up here and you're down there. But I sense the same friendliness uh, and concern that I've so much enjoyed all week and which I'm sure makes the Portland area such a good place to live and to work. And I do hope that we'll have a good discussion this evening. Well now, 
I suppose I should start with some explanation or perhaps even an apology. Uh, what is this thing called post-normal science? The question on everyone's lips. Uh, and why is it post-normal? Have we all unnoticed left behind us an age of normality? Or is my offering just an, another one of those funny things some call the post-posties, coming after modernism or coming after structuralism or what have you? Well, I admit that the name presents problems. It, re it represents the attempt by myself with my close colleague, uh, Silvio Funtovich, to make sense of the new sort of science that is now evolving to meet the new sorts of challenges that we face. Well, what are these challenges? Well, let's review where we're coming from. We have a tradition extending back nearly four centuries of the right way to do science. It starts with the prophets of the scientific revolution, people like Galileo and Descartes, who were much more than just scientists. They were philosophers, they were visionaries. And they promised us that if we had the right method to do science, we would achieve great knowledge and we would command great power over nature. And they were right. It's not merely that we now know much more and can do much more than even the magicians of old ever imagined. More important, with our science, we have transformed human existence. Work no longer needs to be harsh and brutalizing for the many, as it had been really from recorded history until very recently. We all enjoy comfort, convenience, and safety as never before. And under these circumstances, a good and a compassionate society can flourish. We can do things to help the disadvantaged, to rescue endangered species, and to foster our love for each other and for the natural world. And now, even the world's poor can share in this vision and have a hope of a better life. And that's thanks to the realization of the vision of science which was created by this handful of prophets 400 years ago. Yes, so for all this we can thank science, and indeed thank just that normal science, which I am now saying we are post of. Well, what's wrong? Having given the good news, what's the bad news that I came to Portland to deliver? The best way, I think, is to tell something, a little story, that happened to me that made me feel, uh-uh, it's all different now. This was in March 96, just a bit more than three years ago, when I was listening to the morning news and interview program on the BBC. Some of you may know my adopted country, it's the Today program on Radio 4. Uh, and that's where the interviewers get a bonus every time they draw politicians' blood. Well, that morning they had a big, big story. Someone had leaked the story of the epidemic of mad cow disease, which had spread to humans. Now, for the previous years, almost the previous decade, we had been told repeatedly and authoritatively that this bovine disease could not spread to humans. We were safe. And now we discovered that was wrong. We were in danger. Anyone who'd been eating beef was at risk of getting this horrible disease where your brain just degenerates and goes full of holes, spongiform, and you die a most unpleasant death within a matter of months. Well, the Minister for Health was being grilled by the interviewer. And the interviewer asked him, how great was the risk to people who had been eating British beef over the previous decade under the assurance that it was safe? And the minister replied, it's a non-quantifiable risk. And of course, that's a fancy way of saying we don't have the first clue. 
You see, extrapolating age for age, the incubation period among humans is likely to be five or ten years or even more. And during much of that incubation period time, we don't know whether the person is affected. So at that stage, I think they'd found ten victims whose brain sections showed an identical pathology to that of the cattle with BSC. There were ten then, there are a few dozen now. I think it's pushing up four, four dozen, a bit more. If we're lucky, it could level off maybe only a few score victims. On the other hand, in the cattle population, about one or two percent of the cattle at risk come down with the disease, which in a way isn't too bad for an epidemic, but it's a pretty bad disease. And if you say, out of you know something over 50 million people who could have been exposed possibly to the disease one or two percent come down then we're talking about a terrible plague striking down a half million or more within the UK that's a lot of people and then we don't know how many people on the continent of Europe were eating beef that was contaminated, either British beef or their own beef, where no one talked about it too much. So if we don't have luck, this terrible prospect of this devastating epidemic is still with us. And the risk up to now is still non-quantifiable. We had thought we were safe. We were officially assured that we were safe. And now we discover that we are not. In this case, science has not delivered safety. It has left us in a most terrible danger. And it's one of those points at which reality changes. We're now in a new epoch because BSE and its human variant stands as a symbol for the sorts of new perils that we face. Well, what is new about this situation? After all, there have been plagues throughout human history whose course was then unpredictable. And one of the greatest triumphs of science in recent centuries has been in the conquest of epidemic disease. The difference even from my own childhood, when parents lived in terror of the attack of diphtheria or polio, is quite remarkable. And so up to now, the course of science has been one of steady progress in rolling back the borders of ignorance, eliminating the perils of ordinary life, and making us safe. But now a new element has entered. BSE seems to certain to be a technology-based disease. Now the technology is not all that fancy. It was just another of those techniques for making food that bit cheaper, that bit more available to us all. The technique consists of a special process for rendering down meat scraps into an unrecognizable form of powder called cattle cake. And in that form, cattle meat could be fed to cattle, and no one would be the wiser. And in the UK, certainly not the farmers. We might think of this technique as an adaptation of that old fil film, Soy Lent, uh, this time happening down on the farm. And since every disease is to some extent social, we also have to rec reckon with the role of the Ministry, the British Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, called MAF, in purveying and then enforcing a complacency about the disease that was quite stupendous, even by the standards of the British Civil Service. It was quite a one. Now, the cases of mad cow disease and its human version serve us as reminders that these technology-based pathogens are now coming high up on the public health agenda. These pathogens might be these multiple drug resistant strains of bacteria which have been bred up by very predictable Darwinian selective pressures in response to the indiscriminate overuse of antibiotics. People warned about it for decades, now it's happening. Or these technology-based pathogens might be some strange chemicals 
For instance, they're what they call the xenoestrogens, xeno meaning foreign, doing nasty things to the reproductive systems of ourselves and of many other species. We may now even be making new xenopathogens, and as in the possible viral diseases coming from the transplants from other animals as from the pig's organs being transplanted into humans. Now, some of these man-made risks are quantifiable, some are not. And so far we have prevented disasters from occurring, but there's no telling in advance when our luck will run out. And thus, in retrospect, our science, hitherto the bearer of knowledge and safety, will have turned out to have also produced a deeper uncertainty and ignorance and danger. So that is the funny uh, sort of plus and minus front and flip side of the situation of science today. And what I've been reflecting on and what I want to share with you are ideas for making that sort of situation comprehensible familiar and uh, somehow that we can grasp it and then have a better idea of how to manage it. Okay, so now we're into quite serious problems. We see how science can occasionally reduce our safety and produce danger. How can this happen? I just mentioned that science can produce ignorance. As I said, it produces a deeper uncertainty and ignorance and danger along with its benefits. But wait a minute. Science producing ignorance? That's very odd. Am I sort of trying out riddles and paradoxes on you tonight? How can science produce ignorance? Science is, after all, about facts. It's about truth. It's about the conquering of ignorance. Surely there must be some mistake. Well, to explain this paradox, I must step back a little way and examine the image of science that we have all grown up with. What I say may be a, seem a bit caricatured to some of you, but I feel that it fits with the impressions that we get from school and even, at least until recently, from the media. After all, from what I have seen back home in Britain, when it's good news, it's called science, and when it's bad news, it's called environment. And so, Almost by definition, science has the good news. Now, when we're at school, we learn the different sorts of science from big textbooks that have titles like physics, chemistry, biology. The textbooks have exercises and questions in them scattered through the text in order to test our comprehension. And then the answers will be at the back of the book. And so, here for my first illustration of the evening, slight caricature. Uh, there are our sample books of physics, chemistry, and biology with the answers at the back. It wasn't easy to do that on the Clara Straw program, but I managed. <laughs> so as we grow up and become scientifically literate, perhaps the most important thing we learn is this unspoken lesson, and that is, for every question in science, there is an answer at the back of the book. And moreover, there's just one correct answer. All the others, however ingenious or plausible, are wrong. And that's then what science is all about. We learn this at school, university, PhD. Finding the one true answer to our problem that fits with the one that's waiting there at the back of the book. That's what science, is, scientific inquiry is all about. So then we say, quite reasonably, why shouldn't we extend the same principle to the great book of nature? All we have to do is to get a scientist to ask a question, and there, at the back of the book of nature, the one and only correct answer will be waiting to be discovered and checked. Now, suppose someone comes along and says, uh, sorry folks, 
The book of nature is different. There is no answers section at the back. When we ask a question of nature, we don't know which is the right answer. And in fact, we can't even be sure that there's any answer at all. Whoa, that's very bad news indeed. Very unset and unsettling to our trust, I might say our faith in science. Why should the book of nature be so different? And why hasn't we noticed this before? Why did it take uh, this guy coming over from England to tell us that scientific research can be inconclusive or actually failed? Well, let's answer the second question first. We didn't notice, and when I say we didn't notice, I mean it has not been made a great thing of by philosophers or teachers or popularizers, whatever. We didn't notice our scientific, scientific ignorance before this because it didn't seem to matter. With such great triumphs of science piling up all the time, it was only reasonable to suppose that nature would steadily give up all her secrets. There was no limit to what we could know, no limit to our power over nature made possible by science. And I should add, for a long time, science was engaged in a battle for its own claims to truth, particularly against the representatives of organized religion. And it would not be likely to advertise its own inherent limitations and weaknesses. As to the first question, and that is, why should the book of nature be so different? I must refrain from starting a seminar on the philosophy of science. Terry might do that as soon as I give him a chance, but not in this lecture. Let me just remind us, in fact, that nature is a very different thing from physics or chemistry or biology. Indeed, it was something of a trick for me to compare the books. For the scientific subjects that we study are our inventions. They are our models of nature. In some ways, they fit extremely well, as we've seen. But as we are reminded when we consider the environment, these scientific subjects are not at all the same thing as nature. Now, rather than tackling this problem of scientific uncertainty head on, the ways in which our conceptual structures are different from what's out there, I don't want to do that now. I'll focus on the problems of the environment. We'll see that such problems have an inescapable element of uncertainty and even of value loading as well. And all this makes the big book of nature very different from the scientific textbooks. In them, everything is facts and there are no explicit values. Given time, I could argue that values are very important even for those textbooks and also for research, but that would take me too far afield just now. Well, for an easy example of a problem of the environment, let's take a dam. Now, the science behind the dam is very simple. If we think of a dam as generating hydropower, The potential energy of the stored water is converted as it descends to some other form of energy, now usually electricity. In the old days, it could have been a water wheel. And that conversion can be measured by the simple formula which I've written there, E equals mgh, where E is energy, m is mass, g the acceleration of gravity, and h the height of descent. So much for the science. That's it. You want to know how much energy you get out of the dam? There's, there's the formula. That is uncontested science. Then the technology and the engineering coming in through the conversion of that energy to electricity. Here's my cute little diagram. These stand for percentages. The conversion uh, to electricity at a certain percentage efficiency, and then uh, its modification and shipment to users also at a certain percentage efficiency. And so the dam is designed and operated on scientific principles 
turning otherwise useless water into a product that brings wealth and well-being to us all. Well, what's wrong with that? In its own terms, nothing's wrong, of course. It's just there's a lot more to say. And those of you who are already familiar with the work of our Institute for Science, Engineering and Public Policy will know that the distinction among these three topics, science, engineering and public policy, is what makes the Institute so important. Now, first, how do we see the difference between science and engineering? Well, first of all, it's rather trivial, but it should be on the record that no real dam is just a textbook exercise. In their designs, the engineers must cope with more than the inher inherent variability among sites and the uncertainties in the specification of any particular site uh, and what's going to happen. Of course, in addition, and this is crucial, the design of the dam will reflect certain values. Some of these values will be quite explicit. For example, a dam that is designed for the production of electricity will need to have the water level kept as high as possible so as to get the maximum energy of its flow. But if the dam is also to serve for flood control, then it must have a lot of spare capacity ready to absorb uh, all the extra flood water coming into it. Hence, the permanent water level will not be the highest possible. So then, for every foot of water level height that is lost, there's a cost in lost electricity production. Let's try the overhead here. Take our dam again. Ooh la la. And there we see uh, the maximum height, uh, minimum height, and that distance, the distance there represents uh, the lost uh, electricity production for the sake of improved flood control. If we want more electricity, the thing's higher. If you have a big flood upstream, she can go over the top and you're in trouble. If you want to have better flood control, you keep it lower, and then you're not generating as much power. Now, so you have a trade-off between the two sorts of benefits of the dam. Uh, and the trade-off involves a quite an easily quantifiable electricity loss against a numerical probability of a flood problem. And here we come uncertainty, because as we know, you cannot give a precise prediction on future floods. Any such prediction will have its own uncertainty, sometimes severe. And we all know about the so-called hundred-year floods, which recur in a few decades or less. Now, the example is very simple, I and mean, it's really quite caricatured, but at least for me, it says, beyond doubt, this shows how any technological device has values built into its design. How are we to balance these two competing functions, energy reduction and flood control, in our hypothetical dam? I should say that in any real dam, you have other functions as well, uh, leisure, whatever, and you have cost considerations, and so the design exercise for a dam becomes quite complex and highly politicized. But I'm taking this as the very simple example. The two functions will represent different sorts of value to the community, are usually enshrined even in different institutions. And for deciding on the design, science is certainly necessary, but it is not sufficient. Engineering judgment, constrained by design criteria and broader policy consideration, comes into play. In the language which I shall adopt later on, so listen carefully, we have a case where both systems uncertainties, that's in the risks of flooding, and the decision stakes and the trade-off between energy and safety are both moderate. For many purposes, the values at play can be adequately expressed in monetary terms and the science of economics can be deployed to help to provide possible answers. So, in a way, the answers which lie at the back of our big science textbooks can still help here 
in clarifying the, the quantities and the problem, but the dream that there could be one single, unique, correct and best dam is not to be realized by the very nature of the design exercise. Let me carry on a little bit longer with this example of the dam, for it can lead us back to our infamous big book of nature. Sometimes the scientific uncertainties of the dam can become quite severe, especially when its behavior in the long run is considered. There's the possibility, there's the possibility that its lake will eventually fill up with silt. And what would then be the use of a huge chunk of mud? Or some argue that the very weight of water in the lake, combined with the lubricating effect on the rocks below, could eventually trigger earthquakes. And some argue this is a local effect of dams. Or a series of dams creating broad stagnant lakes where formerly there had been a thin stream of flowing water might change the water balance of an entire region and perhaps change it for the worst. And this seems to have happened on the river Volga in, the, in, in Russia where a rather relatively gentle decline with huge earth dams, huge series of lakes, and no one stopped to think that all these lakes are really going to make a completely different hydrology in the whole area. Well, by now our examination of the dam has come a very long way from the simple certainties of the textbook formula E equals MGH. We see how real scientific uncertainties can affect the design of the dam and also uh, can affect the debate on how or indeed whether it is to be constructed. And you may know that there have been huge controversies over the construction of dams past and present worldwide. Now again I must stress that we have not lost the objective factual science altogether. But we have placed it in a context where it is not sufficient for defining the solution which includes both engineering design and public policy. Alright, so far so good. Now let's get into the hard stuff. We think of this lake made by the dam. It will drown some land permanently. Well, on that land there may be human dwellings, usually will be, or certainly wildlife habitats, perhaps even some sacred sites. Now, again, on these issues, is it worthwhile to destroy the habitations, the habitats, the sacred sites? The debate will certainly use science when it is relevant, even use economics when it's relevant. But the issues will not be reduced to the subject matter of any quantitative discipline. Suppose, here's my little old dam the little lake, and here we have our village drowned, here we have our forest drowned, and here we have our Civil War site, and these X's would mark a line of trenches, and the crosses would mark a cemetery, just at the edge of the dam. Is it in or is it out? Okay. Now, can we be satisfied? Suppose there's a scientific study. Can we be satisfied with a scientific study of the return of the subsoil to its natural state so that hardly any human remains are there in that graveyard to be disturbed by the dam? In other words, can we really say, oh well, the graveyard is gone effectively and so the water will be covering over something that isn't there anymore? Or perhaps in the midst of the debate, somebody commissions some economists to do a study of willingness to pay by visitors to the dam site. This shows that most of the visitors, if faced with a clear choice, would rather have a replica civil site moved up the hill rather than pay significantly more from, uh, for their electricity from some hypothetical alternative dam. Willingness to pay, it's a standard tool. Now, in such a case, many of us do not calculate. Our national identity is not to be measured away or sold to the highest bidder. But here I'm using emotive language 
someone else might, with equal conviction, value cheap electricity more highly than all that sentimentality about past events. Now, could science tell us which of these sides is right? No, it could help to frame the debate. It won't give us the answer. Now, people in America are becoming increasingly familiar with this process of high uncertainty and value loading in the design and construction of dams. As you know, for decades, the US Army Corps of Engineers had been straightening and damming rivers up and down the length of the USA, constrained only by its commercially oriented cost-benefit analyses. And then, some 30 years ago, it all began to change. And the US Army Corps of Engineers had to start worrying about these teeny little fish or obscure songbirds, maybe even a rare worm here and there. And at first, they were very bewildered and very angry. But then they began to think again. And now the debate has moved back into the core of science about flood control, about the whole rationale of flood prevention by channeling and damming. And I believe not long ago, the, the core began a program of putting bends back into the rivers and dismantling dams, all in the interest of preserving nature and achieving better long-term flood management. I mean, if there were any ever a recipe for institutional survival, what is better than to spend half a century building this stuff and the next half a century turning, taking it down? That's great. Now, in all of this debate, which has overturned the previous philosophy of damning, no one has ever challenged the basic scientific formulae, like E equals MGH. But no one can go into a public hearing, point to the big book called Dam Science, and claim that the answers are to be found at the back. These issues, then, are issues for debate, not for demonstration. Well, let's come away from the dam and think again about some of these other more general problems of our modern technology. What I think I've shown is that even if the scientific core of a problem is straightforward, then when questions of policy and practice obtrude, the natural science component needs to be supplemented by other sorts of principles and knowledge. But I must tell you, it can be even worse. In the example of the dam, as I kept on saying, there's at least a solid core of uncontested science in the basic theory of the conversion of energy from falling water to electricity. And that sort of example, a technology with a solid scientific core, is typical of the past. And I should say, our modern science-based technology makes a place like this is, has been triumphant just because of this miracle that the abstract, unnaturally stable and pure reality studied in science textbooks and manipulated in science labs, unnaturally stable and pure, that this reality could actually be translated successfully to the world of nature out there. Whether it be electric current, totally artificial creation for the 19th century, the internal combustion engine, or now computers, what we have done is something totally unprecedented in the history of the human race. In a way, we've, we've discovered the ways in which nature behaves sufficiently like a textbook, that we can apply not just the principles, but also the style of scientific research to technology and engineering. And this is why we've won. Now, our present predicaments can be seen as our perhaps belated discovery of the limitations and dangers of that achievement. For as the example of the dam shows, our textbook science only extends to a part of the story. The dam as a real thing involves not merely science, not even merely engineering, but policy and sometimes even ethics and lifestyle commitments as well. There's a lot of nature out there which is still not tamed and which can still strike back. Perhaps the BSE example uh, is, is one to keep in mind now. We're moving away from this 
tame example of the dam, let's now come back to this wild example of BSC. And actually, I'd refer to these new dangers not so much as natural or wild, but as feral, you know, F-E-R-A-L, because a feral species, as you know, is one which has gone wild again. But it isn't really wild. It's partly the product of our interference, and it lacks the natural ability to regulate itself in some sort of um, balance with its environment and its natural predators. And so feral animals are the ones that just go and eat everything in sight. So, moreover, when we need to confront this new feral nature in the raw, the rules of the game become different. That big book of nature not only lacks tidy answers at the back, it can even lack well-defined questions at the front. When we confront the questions that are either more complex, such as disease in its new technical and social environment, or larger in scale as the regional or global environmental issues, the questions themselves become complex, multifaceted, and politicized. Indeed, the framing of the question, which may be predominantly scientific, or technical, or social, or ethical, is itself a crucial act with its inescapable elements of policy and power. Coming back to the UK, think of mad cow disease. Was it primarily a commercial problem of preventing panic by consumers? Was it an animal welfare issue? Or was it a human health, potential human health hazard? Any version of these could have been argued for. In one sense, it was a commercial problem, another sense, an animal welfare problem, another sense, a human health problem. But in Britain, the first problem was the officially defined problem. It was a problem of preventing panic among consumers that ruled the management of the problem for 10 years and with its disastrous results. So when we leave the domain of nature partly tamed, as in the case of the dam, and we're dealing with feral nature, the uncertainties are thus deeper still. We might even say that outside the constraints of the laboratory, sorry, the laboratory, uh, with its unnaturally stable and pure many environments, nature, she speaks with forked tongue. We look at this BSE thing. How did the BSE agent get into the cattle in the first place? Some think that it came from the brains of sheep, which had a similar disease called scrapie. But some think, in fact, it's totally man-made, deriving from organophosphate poisoning. There is actually one organic farmer in England whose cows got BSE in spite of eating only grass. And he said it came from the organophosphates with which he was legally obliged to dip the cattle or slush it along their spines in order to uh, prevent them getting some uh, wobble fly infection. And he then said this comes, it started with the organophosphates, then infected these cattle, then their tissue was eaten by other cattle, and then you had the epidemic. Uh, he has needed a lot of courage to press his theory about the disease. Uh, they really put the heavies on him. But then, once the cattle have the disease, how do they get infected by the BSE agent? Which tissues are infective? We had this ludicrous situation where the government decided that not merely brain tissue, uh, but even the nerves coming out of the spinal cord presented a risk. And so for a while, it was illegal to eat beef on the bone in the UK. Uh, even though the risk was down around 10 to the minus 9th, still the government said, those other chappies put you at danger, we will keep you safe and look quite ridiculous. Uh, then, how does that get into people? In fact, there's this funny thing that one vegetarian has come down with, B with the human version of BSC. Perhaps the, the stuff is inhaled, comes in through your nose and settles in your lungs. Nobody knows, as yet. And again, we don't know when we will know or whether we will know. And yet, we have this shadow of a possible epidemic always behind us. So the biggest worry of all now 
is that this new feral nature is not the same sort of thing as these, my text says, creatures, I suppose I could say critters, that we as a species have known and evolved with. These new perils come from new natures. BSE, the xenoestrogens, most ionizing radiation, not all but most, would never have existed without our intervention. And in that sense, they are science-based hazards. And this is something new and menacing. The frontiers of knowledge are no longer being pushed back uniformly along the line. While there is advance in some places, there's actually a retreat in others. We have created new natures of which our ignorance is acute and urgent. And in those areas, we with our science may now appear less like world conquerors and more like sorcerers' apprentices. Now, none of these uncertainties, troubling as they are, refute the existence of a solid bedrock of scientific knowledge underlying the successes of our technological civilization. But bedrock is not always visible at the surface. And we now face the prospect that the bedrock of reliable knowledge, as enshrined in its simplified form in the textbooks, is simply not always available when we need it, in the form that we need it, in confronting the challenges now thrown at us by feral nature that has been created by science. Well, congratulations. Where are we are from here? One path is to persist in a sort of denial, very popular term now, we are into denial, and to pretend to ourselves and to the public that somehow, somewhere, perhaps packed in Santa Claus's bag, is that big book of scientific answers that will give comfort to little Virginia when she next writes to the Herald Tribune. Down that road lies the sort of rhetoric with which we are only all too familiar. Scientist A goes into the hearing and says, I am a PhD in whatever ology, a professor at an accredited university with 173 publications in peer-reviewed journals, and I tell you that the toxicity indicator in question has a value of only 42, which by international standards is safe. Scientist B then takes the stand, gives his pedigree, and claims that he has proved the indicator has a value of 76, which is dangerous, or vice versa. And then we start to speak of junk science being done by hired guns, uh, working in the service of whatever vested interest that provides them with comfort, either ideological on one side or financial on the other. And if that sort of debate were to become the norm, we would, well, we would be well on the way to the debasement and degradation of quality in science and hence of science itself. Because if that became the norm, if these deep and difficult problems were solved in this adversarial mode, as in a courtroom, then the careful research that is either irrelevant or unwelcome to the strong vested interests of whatever persuasion would be starved out. It would be replaced by the sort of research that provides instant gratification to a clientele, however spurious or meretricious it might be. So the first step to a new understanding of science is the management of uncertainty. How are we to reconstruct our understanding of science for the age of uncertainty, preserving what is good and solid while rejecting what is unsound? In my own work, conducted with my colleague Silvio Fontovich, I've pursued two main avenues of thought. One is the management of uncertainty within science, and the other is about the maintenance of quality in this special sort of science which is now in the policy arena. Let me just say a few words about the first. Those of us who've been through old-fashioned courses in experimental science we remember how, back in our first year course, every quantitative result had to be expressed with an error bar as an indication of the uncertainty associated with the result. Without an error bar, the number was simply incomplete, meaningless, 
just as if it were presented without units. Naively, we thought that in all fields, all quantitative statements should have error bars. Then some of us discovered that the big world of policy-related quantitative research in the natural science as well as the social sciences lacks error bars. All over the place we find bare numbers. What does this mean? Whereas you can't pass, I should hope, a first year course in physics or chemistry without putting an error bar on your numbers, but you could then go into a public debate and say this number is 46.2, finish. Now, whenever you look in fields of policy and environment, you'll find computer models, big, big business. Sometimes they have scores or hundreds of variables and even now require large computers for their processing. This is sometimes called integrated environmental assessment. But then you stand back and you say, where do, where do the data come from which supply the inputs and parameters for these programs? What sort of quality assurance do, do they have? How sensitive are the computer programs to errors of all sorts which occur? For errors in data, errors in data entry, errors in computational round-off, errors in bugs in the software, all the rest. And when, as is frequently necessary, sophisticated statistical tests are performed or large matrices are inverted, what protection is there against the results being artifacts of the process to a lesser or greater extent? So, summing up, we can ask, while there are national and international quality standards for all sorts of other products that affect our lives, where are the quality assurance programs for these products these crucial products of our intellectual labor. By and large, there ain't none. Of course, there will always be some testing here and there by one means or another, but the uncertainties that cannot be tested or controlled will frequently swamp those that can be tested or controlled. Hence, error bars are really quite meaningless in this context, and so they're usually absent. Wow. This sort of science can be described quite neatly. We can ask, do the uncertainties in the inputs of the big calculation need to be suppressed lest the outputs become indeterminate? Some of you may be involved in all this policy stuff, so here's a quite a useful little thing for you. This is the question. Plink. Do the uncertainties in the inputs need to be suppressed lest the outputs become indeterminate? If the answer is yes, then we are in the presence of what I call GIGO. It's not me, other people have used the term already. Garbage in, garbage out. Old thing from wise people in the computer business, if your inputs are garbage, your outputs will be garbage. Computers are not alchemical devices. And actually, there's even a symptom of, Ga of Geiger, quite handy, and that is the precision of the numerical outputs goes up, three digits, four digits, five digits, as the accuracy of the quantitative inputs goes down. Right. And hence, in this historical epoch, we stand in the presence of productions, some of them quite prodigious, very costly, which are strictly vacuous. They have no real content and cannot have any. Perhaps I'm going a little bit fast here, leaving some of you bewildered. Can all this happen in the name of science? Well, for Americans, there should be no problem. Just reflect on the Strategic Defense Initiative. You see how technological vacuity can be supported even on a megabuck scale down through one administration after other af of whatever political party. As we know, Star Wars is back in business thanks to uh, Bill Clinton. So what I'm saying now is that one of the problems that we even as citizens have to be aware of is the questionable quality 
of the, of the inputs, the outputs of science in the policy process. We can no longer take it for granted that just because someone is a professor at a prestigious university, he comes along, puts his hand on his heart and says 72, that that 72 means anything more than something between 1 and 100. <laughs> now that information in itself may be quite important, but that latter statement is not the same as 72. Now, I need not dwell on what would happen to a scientific community if the GIGO projects came to command all the resources and all the old-fashioned scientists were left to starve in garrets. Uh, you may think this is impossible, uh, but it's, I think it, this is something governed more by society than by science itself. My concern here, as shown by the example of the dam, is the problem of quality assurance of science, which may be quite solid at its core, but whose strength and relevance to the issue at hand is not assured. As we recall, the formula E equals MGH will not by itself get us very far in deciding whether to flood a sacred site, like a Civil War battlefield, for the sake of the cheaper electricity from the dam. Okay, so now we come to science and policy. The situation of science in the policy context is thus very different from that pervaded by those wonderful textbooks with all the answers at the back. For these new challenges in science, there are usually no easy answers or not even any easy questions. Indeed, looking at the problems that now arise, we frequently find a fourfold syndrome. And this, if you wish, is my business slogan. Facts are uncertain, values in dispute, stakes high, and decisions urgent. How are we then to tackle the problem of the deployment of science and those policy issues where the scientific uncertainties and the value commitments are both great? Now, for this, we can imagine a two-dimensional array. I've mentioned this before. Uh, I think you'll notice that with all my talk of uncertainties, up to this point, my slides my, are all in order. We have a two-dimensional array, one of systems uncertainties and the other of decision stakes. And we imagine zones on that graph uh, representing increasing severity in either one or both. Now, down in that lower left-hand corner, we have the traditional sorts of problems. Uh, reliably using the energy formula, the fixed per percentages of, for conversion of that hydropower dam. Uh, and this would correspond to the sort of exercises that one learns at science at school, where, as I say, there are no decision stakes worth mentioning as far as the student's concerned, uh, and, and the system's uncertainties have all been ironed out. Now, if we come to the middle band, we have the problems that engage the professional skills and judgments of engineers. They might be design issues involving a balance of functions, or of construction decisions involving the uncertainties in the geology or hydrology of the region. So it's up here in decision stakes, we'll have this whole question of the different functions. Down here with systems uncertainties, we will have uh, long-term behavior, uh, underlying rocks and all that. And then at the outer band, we have the issues involving gross uncertainties for our dam, like the future behavior of the water system or high decision stakes like uh, the burying uh, or drowning of sacred sites. Now, how should we name these zones? Ta-da! There it is. The inner one can be considered a sort of applied science, much like the normal science um, that we are referring to. This is routine work, not too far from the textbook exercises, and really in practice, where almost all questions can be answered, and if you start an inquiry, you're pretty sure you will get an answer at the end of it. Then, the middle, in, the middle band, with your engineer, your consulting engineer, we can call this professional consultancy. And as a reminder, something that a 
uh, puzzled me for a very long time. Uh, why, what makes the difference between a professional and a researcher? Uh, and the answer really is that it's very rarely that researchers can kill anybody. Whereas, um, I mean, unless they try really hard. Uh, whereas your professional will have the lives and welfare of people in his, in his control. If he makes a mistake, I mean, if the researcher makes a mistake, well, you know, pour it down the drain and start again. If a professional, an engineering consultant or a surgeon makes a mistake, somebody suffers badly and takes a different type of training, a different type of ethics, a different type of person, and then usually different types of rewards as well. So, uh, then, here we are. Now, it's this outer band that causes the most trouble. Uh, and my colleague and I discussed names for this outer band for a very long time. I should say, those of you who get curious and look at the literature will find that we launched this scheme uh, with a name which we later discarded. Eventually, we decided on the name post-normal science. Well, why post-normal? What is normal by contrast? And the metaphor works at two levels. On one is a reference to the seminal uh, work by the late Thomas Kuhn on scientific revolutions. There, in his great book, he defined normal science as the regular practice of science. He called it puzzle solving within a paradigm. This is another way of describing the textbook exercises which are the fare of students of science and from which they derive the lesson that, as I've been thumping tonight, all science books have all the answers at the back. For us, post-normal is a reminder that the most important scientific questions are definitely not puzzles and are not at all guaranteed to have answers. Furthermore, in a more general way, post-normal can also describe our age when the normality of confidence that all the great scientific pro and technical problems can be solved, that our conquest of nature will be total and secure, that that normal age is now past. Then there's another one. Why do we call this out there science? Many friends have told us that the idea is great, but the use of science rather than policy is misleading. For science is the sort of thing that happens down in the lower, safer quadrants, parts of the quadrant, uh, where people do things in labs or on computers. The sorts of debates that lie in the wild outer zone are not science, are they? They are policy. Well, I should say that when we reflected on this very sensible, very reasonable criticism, we were confirmed in our choice. A good title must shock at least a little, if it is to be noticed. And we think that the shock of that title is an important part of the message. Now, to explain that, I'll go into a little bit more detail. Let's remember two issues, two possible issues in the question of the building of the dam the long-term hydrology, and the sacred site. Suppose there's a public debate. And then, of course, expert witnesses will appear on both sides, all claiming scientific legitimacy and certainty for their conclusions and recommendations. But alongside the official experts, there's now a new breed. And they are transforming our idea of how science works in the policy process. On the one hand, they can criticize the official science. In this case, Perhaps the assumptions underlying the computer models of the long-term hydro hydrological picture are questionable. And it has been demonstrated again and again that ordinary citizens can be quite effective indeed in assessing the quality of science in terms of the standard procedures which proper research or testing needs to follow. And then on the other side, People with local concerns and local knowledge may actually have a better command of the relevant information than those using standard sources working in an office far away. For example, coming back to that Civil War site and the cemetery.
approaches are quite different from the tightly bounded science of institutionalized researchers exchanging highly esoteric information and evaluating each other's production. And so because of that, seeing the way the whole thing is enlarged and enriched, we speak of an extended peer community and sometimes using extended facts. And so coming back to this word science for post-normal, I ask why should the amateur, the concerned citizen, or the investigative journalist be refused the, di the dignity of being recognized as doing science? They're making a full and effective contribution to the scientific aspects of a public policy debate. Of course, it is not applied science or professional consultancy. It would be mischievous or silly to pretend that any citizen could simply start doing scientific research or engineering design without a proper training and qualification. But the term post-normal reminds us that it is about critical evaluation of science in the context of a policy issue. And on that, experience has repeated, repeatedly shown us there is no monopoly of competence among the accredited experts. It indeed, it is through the involvement of citizens in such debates that new insights can be achieved for the solution of problems. And also, whatever is then agreed is then enriched and assured by having gone through a democratic process. So finally, to sum up my theme, a non-quantifiable risk of the sort that I learned about in connection with mad cow disease is a new sort of object for science, engineering, and public policy. Yet, that is just the sort of challenge which will become increasingly salient in times to come and which will call for the development of more institutes of science, engineering, public policy, like our host tonight. As the reaction of the feral natures that we have created become more severe, our scientific tasks will resemble less and less those of the textbook exercises where the answers were all at the back of the book. We may call this what we like, either the age of risks, uncertainty, or of post-normal science. The names are only pegs on which to hang our ideas. But there can be no doubt that the practice of science is changing and our ideas about that practice, the ideas of both the public and of the scientists themselves, must also change. In that way, and only in that way, can science continue to fulfill its mission of service to the welfare and safety of humanity. Thank you. Tether. Right. Okay. Well now. Get yourself wired up. Am I real now? Oops. Plug it on. Notebook. The water in there. Okay, I'm getting here. All right, thank you. Okay, everybody. Well, I hoped uh, when we invited Dr. Ravitz that he would be provocative, and he has been. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know you can be more provocative because he's been around this week in various places. He has uh, increasingly radical thoughts. Uh, so I'm going to ask a couple questions, get us rolling here, and then we'll go into the audience and see what we can uh, beat up. I was just reflecting that uh, when I first became aware of your work was actually 66 or 67. You published a book uh, entitled Scientific Knowledge and Its Social Problems, which f for me and for I think a lot of people was, was sort of a seminal book in this uh, arena of asking the question of what is the relationship between science and the whole enterprise of science and the search for truth and everything and the greater human enterprise. I mean, where do we fit in and where does, where does humanity and society and fit into science and science into society and so forth? And I just uh, ask you, just like I ask you a general question. In reflecting, you've been counting up the years here, it's been 30 years or better that you've been working in this area. You've been a major player all the way along, 
Um, are you encouraged by, uh, I mean, are we more mature in our grasp of this relationship than we were in the past, or? Oh yeah, enormously. Uh, I've got one little example of this. Um, again, on this Notorious Today program, where the interviewer was sinking his teeth into another politician, uh, who again was saying, well, such and such is safe, uh, there's no evidence that anything has ever gone wrong. And the interviewer said, more or less, I'm going to do a chat. You know, I said, really? He said, I mean, I'm, not, I'm caricaturing it now. I said, really, my dear chap? He says, uh, we all know that absence of evidence of harm is not at all the same as evidence of absence of harm, is it? So, and I thought to myself, wow. Even a few years ago, that sort of thing didn't trip off the tongue. See? But now, at least in the UK, I think partly because of the debates over genetically modified food, uh, it's now common currency. Simply to say, there is no evidence of harm from GM food, therefore, you know, there is evidence of no harm. People say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why is there no evidence of harm? And one reason might be, we've looked for it, but we haven't found it. Another reason might be, we looked for it, but we didn't want to find it. Another reason might be, nobody's looked for it because they couldn't get funding. <laughs> or, as in the case of BSC, nobody looked for it because they couldn't get their hands on the materials. So, if you don't look for harm, you're not very likely to find it, unless the newspapers find it first. So, as I say, now, Deeming, and we, I, I, have, I mean, as Terry knows, I was talking about the whole GM debate uh, in England and Europe. And it is highly sophisticated precisely because here is a hazard on which there is no evidence of harm. And so the whole debate revolves around how we manage our ignorance. And that's uh, it's very new. But as I say, when today program, which you know has uh, some millions of listeners, uh, the guy can sort of work this little bit of scientific methodology. I say, well, it's pretty sharp there. And uh, from the bit I've seen here in the states, it's it's equally sharp. Um, so it's it's. I mean, in a way. Whether we are much beyond the vision, let's say, of Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, maybe not. But then she was a great visionary. She saw it. And then people got very excited. But it takes a generation for people to understand these things and work them out in practical ways. Uh, and I think that's happening. You know, there's a lot of progress in this world. Um, we're coming to terms with our prejudices coming to terms with our failures, and now we're coming to terms with our ignorance uh, about what science and technology is doing. You know, a lot of progress. Good. That's a good feeling. Um, you, we were at it, uh, um, gee, which one, actually, we went to Beaver in high school, we were at, what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Which high school was it now? Well, I'm thinking of the, the, the last one we were at, which was uh, Lincoln High School. That's actually. right. Is that yeah. right? Yes, Lincoln High School, and we talked to a math class. And in that, I was impressed with this, with this, uh, uh, what was the title, it was Moore, Murphy, and Beyond. Which oh, that's was, right. As in Gordon Moore, found one of the founders of Intel, Murphy's Law, so forth. And one of the images that came through there for me that really captured some of this was the, the dominance we've had of thinking in terms, thinking of both mathematics and science and the development of these things in a kind of a Euclidean model. Mm such that you know there's this sort of the axioms and there's the logic and it all kind of comes down in which case of course there should be answers at the back of the book and and if that's not true if that's not what's going on well if that is if, if that's our expectation let's start it that way if that's our expectation then when things um, when things start to go wrong there's a tendency to say well we just need to go back to the axioms we just need to go back and do a little more calculation and let's do another study and this was a this i think in the um, I think in the 60s and 70s, in Congress at least, there's a lot of discussion about this. That was sort of the tendency when there was a, a scientifically, uh, uh, an issue that involved lots of science and technology. Uh, they bring in more experts and do one more study and one more study, and they thought like the uncertainty is going to go down as we go. And, and again, reflecting the fact that it seemed there was this 
image of a highly mechanical uh, world view that made these expectations that we were all going to go that way. And then somehow, I mean, I'd like you to do that, and then Murphy's Law somehow is saying, giving us a different message here, yeah. that maybe that isn't the right image of our model of what's going on. Yeah, well, maybe reality is a lot less comfortable than we'd like to think. Um, I think the occasion for this, I mean, to let you in on the secret, is that, among other things, I've been sort of wondering about this year 2000 phenomenon. And I'm not wondering whether to go up to the highlands of Scotland and dig myself a bunker and hold my Kalashnikov there. Um, but uh, I'm wondering, how did it happen? You know, how was it that this highly sophisticated, highly standardized industry uh, with some very big players in it could have allowed this funny little thing to go on and on, closer and closer and closer to some unknowable mess? And this is not the time for a lecture on that, but one of my explanations was this mindset uh, that. I think when we have been thinking about computers, certainly until quite recently, we think of them as sort of like calculating machines running logically. You see, you know, and they just add knots and crosses and know how to carry from one step, uh, one blank to the one column to the next. And it's, uh, and after all, it's all logical. And so the image that anybody would get of what makes a computer go would be something very much like a mathematical proof. You know, you look at Euclid and it's all there. If this, if that, do this, do that, and wham, there you have it. This equals that. See? And this was then, I mean, it's in a way, it's a sort of a security thing corresponding to my mythical book of nature with the answers at the back. And if you think of it in those terms, it's hard to imagine these imperfections. You know, I mean, what are they doing there? It's like you, you can't see how they could possibly be there. Actually, I think, as I said to the people at Intel, I think it was one of my better wisecracks of the week, uh, that some of you will know of this famous Turing machine. And this was uh, a, pro, a, a model, a logical model of a computer uh, created by this great mathematician, Alan Turing, in the 30s. And it was like what a computer is really all about. And you have a tape. And every time it comes to a point, there's blocks on the tape, it comes to a point, and there's a reading head, and it sees, does the tape say zero or one? And then there will be a little box there of instructions, given the number of the box, sorry, given the, the, of, of that point on the tape, and whether it's zero or one, it then says move forward or move back or whatever. See? And Turing then saw an abstract program, very, very profound. And this influenced our conception of what a computer is all about. And so, as I said, I'll offer it to you for free this time. Uh, Turing's machine's program had no bugs and no bloatware. So, when there are bugs or bloatware in a computer, we say, well, how can it happen? How can it happen? And if you can't imagine how it happens, you don't do anything about it. You, 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 know, you don't know where to start. And I really think one reason for the Y2K phenomenon was that the theoreticians and the propagandists just didn't know what to make of this funny little mistake and couldn't believe that something so trivial could do so much damage. So if you can't believe it, really, then you can't manage it. And that's how I think it happened. Mm -hmm. um, there are other reasons as well, but I won't go into. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So I think, again, it's, uh, in that sense, we are like victims of the success of our scientific worldview. We believe science always has the answer. We believe anything mathematical is like a logical truth. And reality now begins to get much more messy, dangerous, and in a way, exciting. Uh, and we have to start coping with it. Do have a, somebody have a question over here? I'm about to go ahead. Out here. Sorry. Yeah, hello. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> certainly enjoyed this lecture. I, uh, I just fixed a Y2K bug. You fixed one? Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I'm very pleased to hear this notion of uh, the scientific community requiring a quality assurance staff. I, I see a great future for many of us in that. <laughs> yeah. um, I was thinking about some other similar uh, policy debates to the mad cow disease. Mm -hmm. I was thinking in particular of the uh, per almost perennial uh, uh, recreational drug debates we have in this country. Mm -hmm. And it struck me that I've been very frustrated about the fact that just looking at the scientific evidence, there should have been closure on this dis debate maybe on the order of a century ago. Oh. And uh, I guess I guess you've sort of brought back to the surface in me an unease I've always had about that. Sorry, you brought back? Brought back to me an unease I used to have about that, um, having to do with, uh, I feel like, when simple scientific explanations should have produced a policy uh, closure and did not do so, I, I feel like I'm at sea in a, in a terrible storm of politicians. And I'm wondering if you, I mean, what you're offering seems very tempting to me, but I can't quite see where you might cut through some of this turbulence that prevents science from producing answers that are satisfactory and having them carried through in public policy. Um, you want to just respond okay. to that? That's pretty good right there. Fine, fine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there are two questions. I'll take them in turn. Um, this quality assurance thing is funny. Uh, I mean, I've never really, I haven't been sort of working here in the States enough uh, to be familiar with what goes on, but certainly uh, in the UK, perhaps because of pressure from the European Union, uh, you've got quality assurance all over the place. And all industries have quality standards. There are these uh, ISO, International Standards Organization, standards 9,000, 15,000, 16,000. Uh, you have quality uh, assurance seals, and every sort of institution has to go into this th thing. And it's quite sophisticated. It's not simply someone comes along and says, oh, let's check it. But you actually erect the administrative machinery for creating the standards, modifying the standards, vetting them, cross-checking the whole thing, you see. Uh, and it's just in scientific information, which is after all at the heart of the whole enterprise, nobody's done it. I mean, this book that I wrote with my colleague 10 years ago has a sort of uh, a modest success among certain people, and most people don't see the problem. Um, but then I'll just say this one thing uh, on the Y2K phenomenon. Uh, not long ago, there was a letter in New Scientist by somebody saying, well, he doesn't see any problem. If someone has shipped software in the UK that is not Y2K compliant, simply sue him because there has been a British standard for dates ever since 1971 which specifies four-digit dates. You see, what's the problem? Now, the way I read this was that here you have this whole big industry which has been ignoring the British standard. And in fact, I asked a friend of mine in the business to check up on it. Well, it's sort of difficult to find that British standard. You know, nobody knows about it. Nobody cares. So it's this bizarre phenomenon, which you know, is not the subject of my lecture, that just where quality should count most it is the least assured. Now, maybe in a funny way, I don't know, this, this almost in a funny way relates to the other one. Yeah, I mean, politicians are pretty horrible. I mean, you know, and they're, they're venal and confused. They don't care about ideas, etc., etc., etc. I would remind us that scientists get it wrong sometimes too. And uh, right through from the later 19th century up to the mid 1930s, you had some of the very best scientists wanting to help society improve, and they worked it out that the key is eugenics. 
And what they saw was that the inferior orders, the inferior sorts of people, namely the poor, were outbreeding the superior people who were the middle and middle classes and rich. Now we knew that these were inferior because being poor was a sign that they had uh, lost out in the race for whatever, and so they were inferior and they were breeding you know, all these large families and all the nice people like us were only having two children or less and they could predict that in so many generations we would simply be swamped by all the inferior offspring of these people and in fact the more that we have hospitals and health services to keep them alive uh, the worse it's going to be and uh, you look back and you see really wonderful dedicated people like some of them great scientists like Carl Pearson even R.A. Fisher uh, they believe this stuff and in fact uh, there was a point in about 33 when the depression was pretty bad in England and the journal Nature got involved in this and it actually said uh, that especially I think they said among the Iberian races meaning the Celts or the Welsh and these people were permanently unemployed and it argued really that for everyone's good uh, the women there should be sterilized and those families who refuse to sterilize the mothers should be taken off the doll and let them starve. See? Uh, and, and, and lots of people saw Mr. Hitler as doing quite interesting things with eugenics. You see? Quite interesting. Now within a few years they saw, oh my god. See? But right up to the mid-30s, scientists said, oh those politicians, they don't understand, they're soft, they're prejudiced, whatever. Let's use real science. So that's a reminder that with all those prejudices, sometimes politicians have a better sense than the scientists. Uh, please understand, I'm, I'm not defending Star Wars or anything like that. Just simply, uh, we have to, I mean, part of the job of recognizing this ignorance is recognizing science, the best intentions of science can also get it wrong. Okay. Let, me, let me follow up on that a little bit, because um, one of the things that you and I have been talking about during the week, because we both still, I think one thing to say here is that I'm, I'm not pushing, Jerry's not pushing at any point, like we got this worked out. Uh, like, you know, here's scientific problems, here's social problems, and of course if you just look at it this way, they all, we see exactly how they fit together. It's more uh, just the opposite of saying, let's all be aware and recognize and understand that they don't fit together in a clear way. And so, what do we do? And one of the things is this idea that we've been kicking around that the, the very conception of, a, of science is an autonomous uh, form of inquiry and that it's actually coming up with, you know, science is over here and society is over here and you have, you know, you have the, the, the problems that the politicians work on and you have the problems that the scientists work on and then how do you get them together? Doesn't seem to be plausible. And this is where Thomas Kuhn's thing coming in in the 60s came along and said, wait a minute, our, the way we're representing science is this is what we think we're doing in science and with this theory of what we're doing, let's look at what we're actually doing there and go, oops, hey, it doesn't actually check out. So whatever we think science is doing, what we call science, it's called inquiry. Whatever inquiry is doing, we don't have a model of it that corresponds to what actually goes on. So you go, hmm, whatever we think science is doing, maybe that isn't what it's doing. It's doing something, but I think what it's represented is doing is mechanical philosophy coming from Christ. It's not what's going on. Similarly, if you look at the social side and then how that's interpreted, it seems to be a problem there. So, anyway, going back here, it's like, it brings me back like, well, maybe the answer to some of this is not, is to get away from this idea that these are independent to begin with, that there's some, uh, that whatever the enterprise is, whatever the game is, as we've been referring to it, um, science, the, 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 the representation of problem solving and going on that science gives us and the one that Politics is perhaps we're both wrong, and that's where we can get started. I don't know whether that's helpful or not. Well, you can bounce off that something. Neither, neither is guaranteed success. Democracy makes terrible mistakes, but then science can as well. All right. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for your talk, Dr. Robertson, for coming all the way to Portland to speak with us. Uh, when you mentioned my, uh, mad cow disease, I uh, thought about the things that have been in the news about hormones in beef. Uh, can you comment any about the science that's uh, 
United States science versus European science. Uh, not very much. Uh, I think this is one of those cases again where one's not quite sure uh, you know, which is the horse and which is the buggy. Um, it is widely suspected that what this is about is another case where safety is used as a uh, negotiating tool. Um, certainly there are all these arguments I mean, as you know, the latest thing was the EU discovered that in this tiny amount of US hormone-free beef, $20,000 worth, I mean, you know, something you can barely see in world trade terms. But they had been importing beef accepted as hormone-free. They tested it. There they found traces of hormones which should not have been there because it's supposed to be hormone-free. I think they even found traces of hormones that should not have been in any beef. So they then said, well, this is not hormone-free beef, ban the lot. So. Now, the Americans then come back and says, well, maybe there are some traces there, but in fact, whatever is there is far below uh, the threshold for any sort of danger level. So why are you worrying? And accuse them of simply stalling yet again, using science to keep out products and to impede competition. Uh, now, I think all I know from this is to say, yeah, People can use safety, they can manipulate a safety issue. Uh, I have the feeling, however, uh, that the, certainly in UK and Europe, when you come to what we might call a possible risk, that the whole balance of plausibility has shifted. I mean, uh, the Americans can say, you know, there are international standards which show that even if these hormones are there, they're not dangerous. And somebody will say, well, how old are these standards? When were they last looked at? How independent were the scientists? In other words, they'll start, it's what I now call politicized methodology. So they'll look at the standards and question the standards. Now, of course, they're doing it for their own ends, namely to keep out American beef. Mm. They may sincerely believe the beef is potentially hazardous. You see. Uh, but the uh, sectional interest and the concern for safety, I think, in issues like this are impossible to disentangle. Do you understand? Uh, but then that is what these issues are like. But again, um, what I'm wondering is how much shall I say about the bigger issue of genetically modified foods? Uh, and uh, I don't know how much has percolated through to you here, uh, but the situation in the UK and Europe as far as genetically modified food is concerned could be described uh, from the manufacturer's, developer's point of view as catastrophic. And that is that those who are uh, offering and uh, advocating genetically modified foods in the UK uh, and now I think in lots of Europe in general uh, find themselves labelled as purveyors of Frankenstein foods. Isn't it great? I mean, that's the way to sell newspapers, see. And Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth working hand in glove with some of the more aggressive popular press like the Daily Mail, but also quite respectable broadsheet papers like the Independent and others have conducted a highly effective campaign so that, uh, in fact, the week before, a week before last, one of the world's major food manufacturers, Unilever, uh, negotiated with Greenpeace an unconditional surrender. And so Unilever will now produce no GM foods for the UK market uh, and probably not for the European market. 
And here is a case of a hazard where no one has seen anything go wrong. I mean, here is, there is no evidence of harm that I know of. <laughs> and yet, if you say, well, that's evidence of no harm, they say, no, 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 no. It just means we haven't found any yet, but you stick around and we'll find some, and then we will, we will have been justified in banning GM foods, stopping this technology in its tracks, uh, bracketing Monsanto and Milosevic uh, as the two great monsters uh, who are afflicting European society, uh, and, and the whole thing is just, the dam's broken, it's whoosh, it's like that. Um, and I think this is partly because of the way in which it was handled, partly uh, the distrust among the British population of any official reassurances of safety after the mad cow disease, partly the tactics of Monsanto, uh, which were interpreted as arrogance and effrontery, uh, and, so the result, and also the basic thing in a free democratic consumerist society, people say, I don't need to, I, I can buy from the competitors. Um, and so now the GM products that are on sale there, which had hitherto con done quite reasonably, uh, nobody buys them. And then they also say, in the interest of a free consumer society, we want to have labeling. And then you know the issues that arise over labeling, because Monsanto will say, well, if you use the GM label, this is actually a scare label, and that's unfair, because there is no evidence of harm. And you then, I mean, you know about the litigation that goes on here. Well, on the European side, this is just brushed aside. And so we now, it's, it's quite serious because we could face a situation where the United States backing its manufacturers goes to the World Trade Organization and then goes head to head against Europe and the third world in coalition. And so we could find some trade wars that could get really out of control all over a hypothetical risk where there is no evidence of harm. And uh, this is what happens. I mean, I think the whole talk I gave was very upbeat. I really should, next time I give it, I'll remember to put in something. This is what happens if you don't manage these things properly. If you don't maintain and rebuild trust. Then, as I say, uh, consumers become citizens, and boy, they can make a lot of trouble. And as I say, over here, I think there's barely a ripple about it, but I could well imagine if there were some scandal about some American firm pushing GM foods, and Oprah Winfrey came back and got her revenge, and there was some all-American crusade against these people who are poisoning our children with funny genes, wow. It may not happen, but it may. Uh, I'll come back and talk about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, earlier this week, you spoke at Westview High School, whoops, <laughs> and you said that one of the best ways to prevent uh, good science from going bad and producing one of the, <clears throat> being used for uh, bad influences all over the world, such as eugenics, like you said, was to have uh, repeated open dialogue among the people. Do you think that schools and society are influenced, are encouraging this with students rather than than just teaching the basics of physics or biology or chemistry? Um, thank you for that rhetorical question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel quite passionate about it. Uh, and I don't know, you see, it could very well be that here where you have all your multiplicity of independent school districts, it will be easier for this sort of process to get underway. Uh, right now in the UK, because of all, I mean, sort of long traditions of bitter conflict within the world of education, basically between, I suppose you can call them the doves and the hawks, or the softies and the hard guys, or the progressive child-centered people and the old-fashioned people. Uh, this war goes on un unceasingly down through the generations, and at the moment, uh, the hawks are on top. And they are rooting out all the softies and also to do this, they have a central control of the curriculum, uh, which is almost equal to that of France. You know, it used to be said that in France, the Minister of Education could look at his watch and say, ah, yes, now all the fourth graders are doing algebra. See? Uh, well, it's not quite like that in the UK, but it's approaching that. And so to do anything there with science 
with reforming the science curriculum turns out to be just about impossible. The situation is totally desperate. I mean, the science curriculum is rigid, it is stuck, it is totally factual, um, it becomes dead boring, and the result then is that fewer and fewer students do science, the number dribbles down every year, uh, and fewer, ever fewer people actually want to teach science, and so the country is facing a catastrophic uh, collapse of its teaching strength in science. Uh, the whole lot of elderly science teachers are going to go within the next 10 years. Uh, there is need of a thousand graduates to teach high, you know, high school science uh, every year, and they're getting about 150. And so soon, you know, there will be more and more schools where there's no one qualified to teach maths or physics. Um, so this is the way, in fact, that the system will have to correct it. So that something will happen um, where you'll have a collapse and then people will say, what's wrong? Why don't kids want to study this stuff? And the answer, of course, is it's dead boring and irrelevant. Uh, there are lots of experiments. Uh, Terry was telling me of some where, in fact, uh, students are very happy to learn science if it's done in a way that they can see as relevant. Uh, and on that, uh, I think the, the, all the, the new technology uh, with CD-ROMs and, and internet can be absolutely crucial. It is very, very exciting. But it could take the sort of revolution in science teaching, in the structures of it, uh, which I, I suppose only the internet can accomplish. I mean, the, you can imagine everyone's doing their own thing. It may be very disorganized. Uh, but in that way, I think the technology will enable people to start taking control of the, of the science that, they, that they're learning. And uh, as I say here, it'll happen more quickly because school districts will see it's the only way. Um, and in Europe, England in general, in, in England, Europe in general, it will be slower because in those countries everything's more centralized. You have the entrenched bureaucracies uh, who have a lot to lose. Um, so it'll be quite interesting. I mean, this could be quite an exciting time to be involved in science teaching. Very, very exciting time indeed. Uh, we, did we have somebody? Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. please. The ideal segue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I teach science in Portland and mm -hmm. in Oregon. <clears throat> A certain amount of standardization has been put into effect. And my question is, and I hope it's rhetorical. And yeah, sure. Is that I since uh, Terry brought a Briggs, who spoke about chaos theory, to speak in Portland several years ago. Mm -hmm. I've been including chaos theory in most of my science classes as a a way of introducing uncertainty within mm -hmm. certain boundaries. And I wondered whether you would see that as a a good way to to include both hard textbook science and the principles of questioning and, and uncertainty. Mm. Especially uh, because you know, chaos theory being mathematical is therefore okay. It must be hard, it must be okay because it's mathematical. Um, I should say actually a very close friend of mine has written a little introductory book on chaos theory. Uh, his name is Zia Sadar uh, and it's in uh, what they used to be called whatever for beginners. Then uh, they have lots of, it's the very modern sort of thing where you have little hundred word sound bites with the sort of zappy cartoons. And I'm told this is the way young people learn nowadays. And, um, but the book is quite successful. And in that, um, there's actually a plug for myself and post normal science. But it's very nicely done. Um, at first, I was sort of cynical about chaos theory because the main lesson of chaos theory is we don't know. And when it first came out, people said, wow, this is it. We are really going to have a new physics and a new understanding of everything. And what finally came clear was, well, things are very uncertain in these funny sorts of ways. However, it's a very important lesson to learn. Um, and I, you know, anything like that, that we can get in, uh, which sort of chips away at this dreary sort of uh, thing which has it's been going on for centuries. Um, I mean, I remember uh, Kuhn, in fact, uh, if you look at Kuhn's great work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and in a way, if you're in a hurry, you do very well 
and this, I should say, works for almost any book. Uh, you read the preface, the first chapter, and the last chapter. And remembering the preface is always the last thing to be written, and frequently written under conditions of such haste that you're not sure, that you don't correct it and say what is politically correct. You see, I mean, you just sort of all comes pouring out. And if you look at Kuhn's preface in first chapter and last chapter, uh, there you find someone who was profoundly disillusioned by the practice of science and very angry at had been, of having been deceived by the mythology of science. Uh, and I say, it's, it's, I mean, this is the way I read Kuhn. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and this whole idea that science progresses by laying one brick of truth on top of the other. Uh, he, I mean, when he realized that this is false, he was just very, very angry. Um, and I, I won't go into it any further, but almost anything that chips away at this is to the good. Actually, and Kuhn really said at the, in, the, at the, at the, in the last chapter, first he said that the history, uh, that the way that history is purveyed in the official textbook science is, reminds him of 1984. And he then said, and you know, that's, I'm, I'm not just being funny here. In other words, official science, because of its distorted view of reality, actually needs to brainwash its initiates about the way science developed. And in particular, when you look back, you have the good people who had the right answer and the bad people who had the wrong answer. And what Kuhn saw, and because he was studying history of science before it became as sophisticated as it is now, this is, you know, sort of in the late 40s, uh, and if a scientist made a mistake, well, then there was something wrong. And perhaps he was in his dotage, uh, perhaps he was prejudiced, and he refused to look at the facts, you see, because the whole idea of honest error in science was simply anathema to the people who believed that scientific method gives truth every time. And it was like, he was troubled by this, and finally he said, these people are swindlers. They lie about the past of science. And of course, their lies are then purveyed uh, to the young. Now, of course, he wasn't saying they are consciously like that, but this is what they were forced into. And uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of people who say, oh, well, if you don't teach it that way, standards will collapse. Standards will collapse. Standards are always collapsing. Uh, I think I would argue that if you have a situation where people studying science, picking up from your point, uh, start with a problem that interests them. They then master the tools they need, which nowadays or soon they'll be able to learn from high quality instructional materials on the, on the net or on, on the CD-ROMs. So they're not being taught the same stuff by someone who's grinding away year after year after year with no quality control. Then the whole thing becomes really, really exciting. People could have the adventure in science that they did a hundred years ago. And it could be really, really lots of fun. Uh, and I think it'll happen first here in America. Uh, and then, if there's a truce in the science wars in England, it would happen there, you see. Uh, but it's, it, I mean, it could be a great time to go into science teaching. Very frustrating for a while. But if it starts to crack, wow, it'd be fantastic. Okay. There's somebody else, or I get one? Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm glad you talked about fun and entertaining because I think one of the things that happens to science in its traditional mold mm -hmm. is a very unentertaining image. Mm -hmm. I think the aesthetics and the, uh, the aura of entertainment and interest motivates far more people than the search for dry, bare truth. Mm. And I was wondering along those lines, how do you see scientific methodology and aesthetics evolving over the next 10, 20, 50 years? Uh, I'm awaiting a discussion. Uh, I, up to now, and perhaps in a political way, I've been a bit cynical um, about the entertainment thing. Um, actually, in a peculiar way, I got myself involved with a committee studying the public understanding of mathematics in the UK. 
are paralleling the public understanding of science movement. And there are people there who have all these incredible things, you know, maths fairs, mathematics road shows, puzzles, tricks, videos, and the whole thing. And on the one hand, I say, yeah, it's really great. Uh, and obviously, anything that gets through to kids uh, would really be all to the good. And I know you have these science fairs. I confess I haven't got to any of them. I did visit the Exploratorium some years ago. Um, but then I sort of say, uh, maybe these are sort of, um, what do they call them, shills? You know, uh, that you get a kid, I mean, a seven, eight-year-old child, full of enthusiasm, full of questions, and you get in one of these fairs, and he says, gee, this is really great. This is lots of fun. I'm going to study science, you see. And then he's hooked. And then it goes clunk, 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 you see. Uh, and more and more, you know, frog march through a boring syllabus where uncertainties and values are dirty words. And I think they're being sort of lured into something. Now, of course, nothing like luring them in and making them rebels. Uh, but certainly, again, what I can see in the UK situation is that people get lured in uh, by professors and publicists who have the highest of motives but give them the impression that this is what it's like and it ain't like that now hopefully there could build up a pressure so it would be like that but at the moment it ain't and it's just like certainly i don't i wouldn't be able to say here and clearly i think here in oregon uh, you have a very lively and vibrant growing high-tech sector uh, but certainly, if you just look at the correspondence columns of British science journals, again and again you'll see someone who perhaps went to a science fair all the way back, really got to like science, maybe got to a decent school, was given his head a little bit, uh, loved it, got to a good university, did science, wow, got a good degree, wow, went through, uh, lived on beans for another three, four years, got a PhD, and then looks for a job, well, there are no permanent jobs, but he gets to be a postdoc. And he's a postdoc here for two years. Oh, well, no permanent jobs, postdoc there for three years. All around he goes, then one day he's 40. And people say, oh, you're too old. You're too expensive. We can't give you a grant, and we can't hire you anymore on our grant. And this person's just dumped. Go drive a taxi. And I say, well, obviously, the people who ran that science fair, you know, sort of 33 years ago, had no idea that this was going to happen. But that is the life of research in the UK today. Unless, you know, unless you get into a really good high-tech company uh, and then settle in an industrial environment. But in the non-industrial environment, that's what it's like. Uh, you're a sort of casual labor from one contract to another until they dump you. And that's a very bad state of affairs. So that, in a sense, that is why I'm a bit cynical about the entertainment thing at the moment. On the other hand, I think, again, it's one reason I'm really happy to be here, come to this place where, obviously, things are changing. And the other speakers in the series talk about change uh, in ways which really only happen in America. Uh, they can, you know, they, they feel technology is going to make it all happen. And... Uh, I feel, yes, you know, maybe all this fun science will sort of whoosh in, take over. And kids will say, you know, we want to do this in the classroom, you know, just let us get on the net and do our stuff. And then you could have all sorts of excitement. I mean, remember, it's partly a question of what's the leading technology. In America, up until certainly through the whole 19th into the early 20th century, you had inventors. This is a country, great people, great place. Somebody would have a shed and go back there and you could work then with very simple mechanical contrivances and do really exciting things. So, you know, make things more cheaply, more effectively, whatever. It was a great land of invention. And then as basic industry changed and got heavier and heavier, the invention process got incorporated. But perhaps now, with a new technology and a slight that a new social order, invention of this sort, perhaps of gadgets, perhaps of fun things, perhaps of artistic creations, may start to flourish again. And it can become exciting all over again in a new way. Um, you know, I'll have to come back and sort of soak in more of this and see. I mean, can I put in one comment? Please. That you and I have talked about this. Um, the, uh, 
this idea that, that there are two motivators, maybe a distinction between two motivators of going into science or engineering. And, and one of the phenomena I was struck by in the engineering community and uh, working with them is, is this data that says that engineers will uh, make great sacrifices, uh, financial sacrifices, uh, to work not on a, uh, not a project that's fun or that's highly rewarding in terms of money or prestige or anything, but if it's a worthwhile project. In other words, if it's a, and I mean that in the sense of, as an engineer would look at it, if this is a neat project from an engineering project, this is an interesting project, this is a meaningful project uh, where they can really get involved in it, they go for it. And this is sort of what we were talking about with the school, with David Tucker, mm -hmm. this guy in uh, Mount Hood, or Mount Baker High School who's done this with the kids that one of the one of the distinctions between you know steve gould talks about the science museums turning into uh, uh fairs and uh you know things like that and it's fun and great but the other motivator besides being gee whiz and fun and cute is some more subtle thing about a problem you care about a problem you get involved in a problem that means something to you even though it might not be actually fun at all mm -hmm. might not very be very rewarding require you to have a lot of sacrifices but you'll invest yourself in it and you'll go after it and you'll be powered by it and encouraged to go on a different kind of motivator in that uh, that's such kind yeah. of kind I mean I, I feel I mean this is purely temperamental uh, and I would really not lay this on anybody else but that's the sort of thing I, I mean I'm a very intense moral sort of person you see so uh, that's what vibrates with me but again some remembered you never know what's going to happen in a technology uh, you have now in software development uh, this whole movement for opening source codes. So you have Linux, you see, which is now a community possession. Um, Netscape tried it with mixed results. Uh, Apple is now putting their forthcoming operating system out. Source code is going to be public. And so the whole idea of here are these big corporations that control the key intellectual property. And if you want to have a piece of the action, you work for them under their direction. Maybe that's going to start fragmenting now. And even software development may just come into a renaissance where it'll all be, you know, it'll almost like be all shareware, although obviously with hopefully rather better controls than in the old shareware. Um, and so, it, you know, we don't know, but there are all these tendencies. I think there are, as, 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 as Terry said, there are lots of engineers out there who are desperate to do good work. And if they get a chance, they will. And we could have an, a, a renaissance, uh, a flourishing of really exciting software uh, that, you know, I can't imagine because I'm, 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 I'm not close enough to it. So, in a sense, the, the, the aesthetic ideal and the moral ideal uh, which are really complementary in a way, which under conditions of big business, big organizations, uh, and it, it may be the profit motive, it may be bureaucratic protection motive, it doesn't matter. Uh, all of that which has really been stifling a lot in industrial development all over the world, perhaps it's ready to sort of be cracked a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then it can be really exciting. And I think, and this is one of the parts of the world where you can see it happening early on. It's great. Yeah, I want to think of that because one of the things that happens if uh, I was going to make this mushing of what is a scientific problem and mm -hmm. what is a social problem, mm -hmm. in one of the places where the rubber hits the road on that is uh, research policy and the funding mm -hmm. of research policy. Mm -hmm. And we've watched this thing where there was this enormous uh, investment in nuclear, yeah. which is actually still, I, I think MIT just got another $1.5 billion to play with their, refu with their fusion. Uh, fusion. Game. And the other GMs, you have this other movement. I know you've been involved in this, and you were mentioning in, in uh, European Union that there's this increasing idea. It's a different metaphor of research, a different direction of science. The idea that there's one direction here gets violated, and that we would that we might be better off investing in research that leads towards uh, photovoltaic and a whole range of of uh, technologies or applications that are sustainable, that was the, the metaphor, right. sustainability. Mm -hmm. And that uh, somehow we've talked about a yang world of science, and now we're going towards a yin world of science, mm -hmm. something much more sensitive. And that that's the sort of, I mean, I talk in my, I have a couple of kids that are 13 and 15, and you talk to them about scientific research, they want to hear the things that they're clicking on are like sustainability, is it going to, is that exciting? 
You know, it's not like, uh, gee, we could create a nuclear power station or something. I mean, is this a, is this a good sign? I mean, are we, yeah. is there something going on there about yeah. Yeah. a good shift? Yeah, I think, in fact, all the ruling metaphors are running one way, you know, in the green direction. Um, and as usual, there will be a lot of confusion uh, and, and on the ground. Uh, but let's say sustainability, which actually I, I have, I mean, I'm on the fringes of some of this, and what I find most encouraging is that the people who are the most active, at least in my side of the ocean, the most active in doing things about the sustainability are the first to say, we don't know what it is, we cannot define it, but we know we have to start in a particular direction and we will learn as we go along. And so, uh, what, I mean, actually, in the 70s, someone came out with this really cute idea, Blueprint for Survival. I guess that was in the days when they still had blueprints. <laughs> blueprint for Survival. And they actually laid out the dates by which things had to happen. See, and that was it. And now we know it ain't like that. Uh, there's a sort of popular Spanish song to the effect that we make the road as we march along it. And that's okay. So again, there's this open-ended quality and a recognition. We don't really, I mean, we don't need to have the goal defined in order to start moving towards it. Uh, and again, you know, that's very yin again. It's, it's very, very open. It reminds us that it's a learning process. We are ignorant now. It's okay that we're ignorant uh, because we are all learning together. And this sort of thing is, I think, it's, it's the way it's the way to, to sustainability and survival. Um, and I find, again, that very, very hopeful. But again, it's, a, it's living with the ignorance. It's not being afraid of being ignorant, not being afraid of knowing, yes, we will make mistakes. It's just like, you know, anyone who's familiar with startup industry, which you all know around here, you just know you get a business plan and you will not follow the business plan. You will make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. The question then is not whether you'll make the mistakes, it's how well you will cope with the effects of the mistakes. Uh, and this is a totally different conception of what it's all about exactly. than the sort of thing that you'll get in many business schools, where they still teach management as if it's applied physics. Um, and I, I think, again, it's all these different sorts of approaches, uh, which, for me, are the way to the future. I mean, I, I thought this evening it would be handy to start off talking about the dam and the values and the uncertainty uh, and all that stuff uh, as, as a way in, you know, just to start the discussion going. But quite clearly, it's much more than that. It's, it's a whole style of thinking about science and ourselves in the world. And it's saying that something that has worked fantastically well for the, the last 300 years uh, it's no disgrace that we can now stop and have another look at it and see is another style now becoming appropriate. Good. Let's see what that go. I have the last word. Yeah. And any of you who are here, since the number that will be stay around, any of you who wants to go to the reception if you're not, just all go up there, okay? Because there's food and stuff at those go. For those who survived, those who survived this last thing.